Hey friends, welcome back to the channel and to the monthly favorite series. It is making a comeback in these troubled times. Today, we're going to be talking about a blog post, a podcast, a physical product and a book series. So let's just jump into it. All right, so first on the list of this month's favorite things is this blog post from collaborativefund.com called How to Read. Lots of inputs and a strong filter by Morgan Housel. And I came across this a few weeks ago and it really resonated with me. I'm basically just going to read it out to you because it's short enough that I can just read it on camera and I think it's very good. So. My reading strategy is to start as many books as I can, but finish few of them. Years ago, I heard Charlie Munger say, most books I don't read past the first chapter. I'm not burdened by bad books. And it stuck with me. Reading is a chore if you insist on finishing every book you begin, because the majority of books are either A, adequately summarized in the introduction, B, not for you, or C, not for anyone. Grinding your way to the last page of these books, a habit likely formed early in school, can turn reading into the equivalent of a 10 hour work meeting where nothing gets done and everyone is bored. And once you see reading through that lens, your willingness to pick up another book wanes. Which is of course tragic. The man who doesn't read good books has no advantage over the man who can't read them, said Mark Twain. Every smart person I know is a voracious reader, who also says every smart person I know is a voracious reader. There are so few exemptions to this rule, it's astounding. College tuition at $25,000 a year comes out to roughly $100 per lecture. Good books, sometimes written by the same professor, can be purchased for 15 bucks and can offer multiple times as much life-changing insight. So before we continue, just a few thoughts on this. I think this is really important. I made a video a few months ago, I think, called how to read more books, uh, kind of eight tips for reading more or something like that, where I basically said this thing that we should move away from this idea that a book is like a sacred thing that we have to start and then finish. And I said that I, I know so many people, so many friends, so many friends of mine who, you know, started reading Sapiens and are still like 20% through it and feel like they, they can't physically read another book until they finish Sapiens because for some reason we regard reading books as this massive undertaking that, oh, I have to read the whole book. It's, it's a complete myth. And this article really corroborated this feeling that I've had for years, which is that, you know, reading a whole book is kind of pointless especially if it's a non-fiction book, especially if you've gotten most of the ideas already from a summary or from like the introduction or from the table of contents. Because often when it comes to non-fiction books, really there's usually kind of a, a handful, if not let, if not fewer key insights that the author wants to get across. But in order to turn it into a book, they have to flesh it out for like a few tens of thousands of words with more like examples and things. And once they release that book, then they can start doing speaking gigs and, you know, get, getting paid $50,000 to speak at a conference. And, you know, writing a book from, from, from what I've heard unlocks, unlocks this really lucrative world of conference speaking. And so tons and tons of nonfiction books are a lot longer than they need to be. And so if you're reading a nonfiction book and you don't like it, or you've got the main idea, then by all means just drop the book. It's a real shame to think that you have to finish a book. Anyway, let's continue with this article. Um, the conflict between these two, most books don't need to be read to the end, but some books can change your life, means you need two things to get a lot out of reading. You need lots of inputs and a strong filter. If you only pick up books you'll know with certainty you're going to like, you'll confine yourself to reading the same authors on the same topics. It gives fresh oxygen to confirmation bias and limits your ability to connect the dots between different fields and different cultures. It's better to have a low bar in what books you're willing to try, and even the faintest tickle of interest should be enough to make the cut. Kindle samples are free, so excuses are minimal. Yeah, I fully agree. This is really important. We should be getting the loads and loads and loads of inputs. But then he goes on to say, once you've flooded your desk with inputs comes the filter. It should be ruthless, taking no prisoners and offering no mercy. Similar to dating, a book you're not into after 10 minutes of attention has little chance of a happy ending. Slam it shut and move on. You're not a failure if you quit a book after three pages any more than if you reject the proposition of a 10 hour date with someone who you just met who annoys you. Lots of fish in the sea. <laughs> This applies to more than reading books. It's true for all kinds of data, research, conversation, and learning. Without flooding your brain with inputs, you'll be stuck in the teeny tiny world of what you've personally experienced. But without a strong filter, you'll be overwhelmed with choice and paralyzed by inaction. A good reading filter is more art than science. You'll have to find one that works for you. The bigger point is that the highest odds of finding the right piece of information comes from inundating yourself with information, but very quickly being able to say, that ain't it. This is really good. This is really good advice. Um, and I read this and I was like, oh my God, this is such legit advice, really resonated with me. Perhaps there's some element of confirmation bias there where he is saying what I believe to be true anyway, and therefore agreeing with it makes me feel intelligent. That, like, you know, someone who's written an article on the internet agrees with me, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think there is definitely merit to the theory that you need to have lots of inputs and a strong filter. And so ever since coming across this, that really solidified this in my mind. And so now when I read I try and kind of get loads and loads and loads of inputs 
but I have even more ruthless a filter for not continuing past things that I don't enjoy or that don't resonate with me uh, than I previously did. So I will put a link to this blog post, which you should check out and save to Evernote or Notion or wherever you save your articles and things. Um, and I will be certainly be reading the other articles on collaborativefund.com and maybe you can check them out. And if anything strikes your fancy and you want to send it my way, drop me an Instagram DM or an email, ali uh, Yeah, that's it. Let's move on to the next one. All right, secondly, I want to talk about a podcast that I listened to a few weeks ago and that really, really resonated with me. And it's an episode of the podcast Invisibilia and it's called Emotions. And I'll put a link to that down below in the video description. You should definitely check it out. Um, I'd never heard an episode of Invisibilia before. Apparently they examine like the invisible, the invisible things that we take for granted and kind of go, go deep into them. But this episode uh, about emotions really, really, really hit me hard because it, firstly, it's like amazing narrative storytelling. Like it tells the story of a lorry driver who crashed, who's, who, like, who essentially killed a family by them crashing his, their car into his lorry. Um, and it talks about all these different emotions that the parents are experiencing and the lorry driver is experiencing. And then it talks about, uh, in, in, in interviews an expert who's written a book about this sort of stuff, about w like what the origin of emotions is and where emotions come from. And sort of turning the theory on its head that we, we sort of think that emotions are formed as a reaction to events. Like if we experience trauma, then we will have a certain kind of emotion associated with that trauma. But what they talk about in this podcast and with this interview from this expert, I think her name is Lisa or something, can't remember. Um, but they talk about how actually there's potentially only four main emotions, sort of internal feelings that we can experience. And that is, I think it's something like pleasant, unpleasant, attention and inattention or something like, or like arousal and inattention or something like that. And essentially every emotion we experience as a result of these four internal sensation, that is just a story that we're telling ourselves through socializing, through society. And they make the point that in societies where we don't have specific words for specific emotions, people don't feel those emotions. And that's like completely mind blowing because you would think something like fear or love or anger, you would think that these would be universal emotions. But what these guys are arguing is that actually it might not be that universal. Maybe it's just the story that we tell ourselves that when someone shuts the door in your face, then that slightly unpleasant feeling that you experience, which all your body knows is just slightly unpleasant, you interpret that as being anger and then you have this like anger response to it. So that was really interesting, but like, I, I really can't do it justice. The whole podcast episode is an absolute like marvel. It's just so well done. It's really, really highly produced. I think it's done by NPR. So it's gonna be like super highly produced, background music, voice actors, blah, blah, blah. It's really, really good. Link in the video description, you should check it out. Uh, Invisibilia, the emotions episode. So let's move on to the next bit. Thirdly, I wanna talk about a physical product and that is this, Uniball Air. This is my new favorite pen. And um, there was a fifth year medical student who was on placement with me a few weeks ago called Marius uh, from Cambridge. Thanks, Marius. Uh, I saw him writing with one of these Uniball Air pens. And anytime I see someone writing with any sort of pen, I like to ask, oh, what's that pen? Why did you choose it? And he said, oh, mate, once I discovered this pen, it changed my life. And I was like, oh, mate, this is sick. So immediately I bought like a pack of 12 of them off of Amazon Prime, Uniball Air. And it's really nice because I can't, I can't really show you on camera, but it just like, it sort of glides over the paper really nicely. And I've been combining this Uniball Air with my Leuchtturm 1917 notebook, which I've talked about in a previous monthly favorites video last year. This is great. I'm, I'm still writing in the same one and every day I like do different things with it. That sounds really weird. Um, but I filled up loads of pages on it. And actually I've got a video coming out soon, or if it's not out already, talking about how I use this as a sort of analog to-do list type thing. Um, anyway, I've combined the Uniball Air with my Leuchtturm 1917, and now this is now my favorite way to write in the notebook. Um, as I said, the, the nice thing is that it like really makes you makes your writing glide over the surface of the page. Uh, the slightly annoying thing about it is that if you're not careful, your handwriting can get quite messy. So I think it, it's it's good for me because it helped me like write really fast, which means in a way, even though writing is still like 10 times slower than typing, it's less slow with this pen than it is writing with a fountain pen because fountain pens really annoy me because I can't write very fast with a fountain pen because it just doesn't flow very nicely. But yeah, Uniball Air is really good, uh, but you do have to watch your handwriting. So yeah, I'll put a Amazon affiliate link in the video description if you want to you know, give me a 1% commission from Amazon if you buy this pen. But yeah, genuinely it's sick. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's changed my life, but <laughs> it just makes writing in my notebook a little bit more pleasant and that just, that's worth sharing. That's an idea worth sharing. I should give a TED talk on this. So uh, let's move on to the next one, I think. 
And finally, I want to gush about an audiobook series that I've been listening to for the last many, many, many months, if not more than a year. I can't remember when I started listening to this, but it's called the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. Robert Jordan is now, I think, dead. And I think Brandon Sanderson, who is my favorite fantasy author of all time, sorry, JK Rowling, Brandon Sanderson took over writing the last few books of the Wheel of Time series. So I've literally just finished listening to book six um, and I've just been listening to it on Audible nonstop. Ooh, audible.com forward slash Ali Abdal, link in the video description. Not sponsored, unfortunately, but you can get a free trial of Audible with that link anyway. Um, I've been listening to it on Audible like, basically since like, uh, when was it? I think since late 2017, I've always had a fantasy audiobook on the go on Audible. So I started off with the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson, which I talked about, I think in January 2018, in the first episode of this monthly favorite series. Then I read the King Killer Chronicles, or I, I listened to. So that's The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss. And we are all anxiously awaiting book three of that series called Doors of Stone or Walls of Stone or something like that. Um, but I talked about that in a monthly favorite series in a video. And then it was the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. And it took me a whole year, I think, to get through the Stormlight Archive. I listened to it from 2018 through sort of mid late 2019. And that was the first three books of that. Uh, again, we're all anxiously awaiting the fourth one, which should be out, coming out November this year, I think. And then after listening to the Stormlight Archive, I then jumped into the Wheel of Time. And I think that was a good order to do it in because the Mistborn series is a good kind of gateway drug. It's, it's really long, but it's also very sort of high, high impact. Um, and it kind of gets you into this whole fantasy thing. Then the Stormlight Archive is really, really long. And there's like tons and tons. It's, it's, it can be quite slow at times. So I think having a background in fantasy and kind of knowing what to expect helps you get through the Stormlight Archive. Otherwise, you know, at least for the first half of the first book, it can feel like what's going on. I don't understand what's happening. But then the Wheel of Time is absolutely huge. I think there's over 12 books in the series. Um, I've been avoiding looking at any kind of book titles because I don't want any spoilers at all. Um, but I've just been listening to them nonstop. It starts off with the Eye of the World and I can't remember what two, three, four, five and six are, but I'm on book seven right now. And it's just absolutely sick. Um, let me tell you what it's actually about. It's hard to say really, because like with these really long fantasy series, the way, the way it usually works is that you start off very, very small in like a little village or something with like one character. And then as the books in the series expand, you unlock kind of more of the world and you get more and more characters coming in and the main characters get more powerful. And you know, the kid with his sword is getting beaten up by the big dude. He gets his, um, you know, he becomes a blade master or, you know, stuff like that. And then he becomes an absolute Don. That's kind of the formula of these fantasy books. And so, the premise of the first book is that there are these three kids called, um, what are the names? Uh, Rand, Perrin, and Matt. And they're in this little village called Emmons Field, which is in the two rivers, which is tucked away. It's, it's sort of like the Shire in Lord of the Rings. It's like, you know, tiny village in the middle of nowhere where everyone lives a subsistence lifestyle. But then a woman comes and tells them that they are like the chosen ones or something. And she's like a wizard. And then some baddies attack the village and they, she and the three boys and like the, a few of their mates, they have to go on this adventure to find, to get more training and defeat the Dark One. And it sounds really, really bad when I say it like that, but everything sounds bad when you try to explain it, explain it in those sorts of words, but it's just absolutely sick. So if you have not yet started listening to fantasy audiobooks, then please do yourself a favor and start with Mistborn, then do King Killer Chronicles, then do Stormlight Archive, then do Wheel of Time. And you'll literally have like, I, th I think on my Audible, I, I, I listen to about 20 to 30 hours of audiobooks every month. So on average, I'm listening to audiobooks for one or two hours a day, depending on how often I'm driving to work. And these days, exclusively when I'm driving to work and back or when I'm at the gym, which I'm not anymore because of social isolation and stuff. Social isolation, social distancing. Uh, but when I'm driving to and from work, I just listen to audiobooks. Um, so even with doing that for like two hours a day, basically for ages, it like, it's still taking taking me months, if not years, to get through these fantasy books. So this is absolutely fantastic. Like, if you haven't yet embarked on this journey of fantasy audiobooks, and you start off with in this order that I've recommended, you will literally have the next like three to five years ahead of you sorted in terms of audio entertainment on the go wherever you are. And the best thing is that Brandon Sanderson continues to churn out novels. Patrick Rothfuss is in the process of writing the third book of, of the series. And there's loads of other kind of fantasy audiobooks that I can't wait to dive into but I'm trying to kind of savor them as I go along. I made the mistake with Mistborn actually of, I started listening to it on Audible and then because it got so good, I switched to Kindle and I just kind of tore through it. And I kind of regret doing that because, because I read so fast and tend to skim a lot, it means that I miss a lot of the savoringness that happens when I listen on Audible. Like listening to something on Audible, it will take me 10 times longer to get through it, but I will enjoy it more because I'm like, you know, 
I'm, I'm you know, I've got, it, I've got it on Audible. The other really nice thing about fantasy books, audiobooks rather than reading, is that when you're watching a TV show, I think I've said this before, but like, when you're watching a TV show, the climax of the TV show lasts a few seconds at most. Like you kind of know what's going on. And if it's like a really amazing fight, fight scene or something, then fine, maybe it lasts a few minutes. But with audiobooks, the climax is lost for absolutely ages. Um, <laughs> I can remember like when, whenever it gets to the end, to like towards the end of these books, like the, towards the end of the Wheel of Time series, there's always some like big thing going on. And that's like a huge climax. Stormlight Archive was an absolute masterpiece at doing the really, really long climaxes. Like I still get tears in my eyes when I think about the end of the book one of the Stormlight Archive and like all the stuff that happens with like Kaladin and Dalinar and stuff. And it's just like so, so, so epic. And I remember in Stormlight Archive, when I got to that bit of the book, I, I just arrived home from the gym and I literally just sat here on the sofa for like four hours until like three in the morning, just like listening to this because it was just like so sick. Anyway, fantasy audiobooks, man. They're really the one. Mistborn, then King Killer Chronicles, then Stormlight Archive, and then Wheel of Time. And by the time you've listened to all of those, I'll have finished the Wheel of Time and I'm starting some more. So I'll be continuing to recommend loads of fantasy audiobooks on this as we go along. So. Yeah, that's, that, that's basically it. Check it out. Uh, I'll put links in the video description. And if you want to go to audible.com slash Ali Abdal, you'll get a free trial. I, this, this is not a sponsored video. I won't even get paid for that, but you know, you might as well use my link. Oh, and if, if enough people use my link, then maybe if Amazon are tracking how many signups they're getting through my link, maybe they'll be like, hey Ali, we want to sponsor another video of yours. So that'll be the potential benefit of you signing up to a free trial of Audible. Uh, so that's it for this month's monthly favorites. Thank you for watching. Um, I will put a playlist here of more monthly favorites. If you haven't seen them, you should check them out. They are quite like evergreen. I don't I don't tend to review things that are like, oh, this month I'm talking about this thing that's only relevant for this month. They tend to be sort of perennial recommendations. So if you start from January 2018 and just kind of go through the series of monthly favorites, you will find interesting books and articles and podcasts that I've recommended over the years. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.